September 18, 1900, Volume 4, Charity Towards One's Neighbor. Louisa prays Jesus to take her to heaven. This morning, my adorable Jesus transported me outside of myself and showed me the many evils committed against charity towards one's neighbor. How much sorrow they caused to most patient Jesus. It seemed that he himself was receiving them. Then all afflicted, he told me, my daughter, one who harms his neighbor, harms himself. And by killing his neighbor, he kills his soul. And since charity predisposes the soul for all virtues, because charity is missing, the soul is predisposed to commit all sorts of vices. After this we withdrew, and since for several days I had been suffering from an intense pain at my ribs, I felt exhausted in my strengths. Compassionating me, blessed Jesus told me, My beloved, you would like to come, wouldn't you? And I, Heaven's willing, my Lord, that this pain be the cause of my coming to you. How grateful I would be to it. How dearly I would hold it as one of my most faithful friends. But I think you want to tempt me like the other times, and by exciting me with your invitations, since I would then remain disillusioned, you would come to make my martyrdom more cruel and harrowing. But, oh, please have compassion for me, and do not leave me on earth any longer. Absorb this miserable worm into yourself, for I have the right to this, since it is from you that I came. All moved in hearing me, lovable Jesus told me, Poor daughter, do not fear, for your day in which you will be absorbed in me will surely come. Know, however, that your continuous violence is to come to me, especially after my invitations, do great good to you, and make you live in the atmosphere of the air, without a shadow of any human weight. So much so that you are like those flowers which have not even their roots from the earth. By living in this way, suspended in the air, you come to amuse heaven and earth, and in looking at heaven, you are amused by it alone, and you nourish yourself with all that is celestial. In looking at the earth, you feel compassion for it, and help it as much as you can on your part. However, at the comparison with the fragrance of heaven, you immediately perceive the stench that emanates from the earth, and you abhor it. Could I perhaps place you in a position more dear to me and to heaven, and more beneficial for you and for the world? And I, yet, O oh my Lord, you should have compassion for me by not prolonging my residence down here, for the so many reasons I have especially then for the sad times that are preparing. Who would have the heart to see such a bloody slaughter? And also for your continuous privations that cost me more than death. As I was saying this, I saw a multitude of angels around our Lord saying, Our Lord and God, do not let yourself be importuned any longer. Make her content. We are anxiously waiting for her. Wounded by her voice, we have come here to listen to her, and we are impatient to take her with us. And you, O oh chosen one, come to cheer us in our celestial dwelling. Blessed Jesus, moved, seemed to want to condescend, and he disappeared. As I found myself inside myself, I felt my pain increased, so much so that I was in a continuous spasm. But I could not understand myself for the contentment. September 18, 1906, Volume 7 Peace is light for the soul, light for her neighbor, and light for God. After struggling very much, 
I was feeling all oppressed and almost a little disturbed, thinking about why my adorable Jesus was not coming. Then he came in passing and told me, My daughter, peace is light for the soul, light for her neighbor, and light for God. Therefore a soul who is at peace is always light, and being light, she is always united to the eternal light from which she draws ever new light so as to be able to give light to others also. So if you want ever new light, be at peace. September 18, 1917, Volume 12, Effects of Constancy in Good. Continuing in my usual state, I was in the midst of pains, more so since my celestial mamma had made herself seen, crying. And as I asked her, my mamma, why are you crying? She told me, my daughter, how could I not cry, since the fire of divine justice would want to devour everything? The fire of sins devours all the good of souls, and the fire of justice wants to destroy all that belongs to the creatures. And in seeing the fire running, I cry. Therefore, pray, pray. Then I was lamenting to Jesus about his privations. It seemed to me that without him I could take no more. Moved to compassion for my poor soul, my lovable Jesus came, and transforming me within himself, told me, My daughter, patience. Constancy and good puts everything in a safe place. Even more I tell you, that when you are deprived of me, fighting between life and death, for the pain of being without your Jesus, and in spite of this you remain constant and good and you neglect nothing, you do nothing other than squeeze yourself. And in squeezing, love of self, natural satisfactions come out. Your nature remains as though undone, and what is left is a juice so pure and so sweet that I take it with great delight, and I soften, looking at you with so much love and tenderness that I feel your pains as if they were mine. So if you are cold, dry, and the like, but you remain constant, you give as many squeezes to yourself, and you form more juice for my embittered heart. It happens as with a prickly fruit with a hard skin, but which contains a sweet and useful substance inside. If the person is constant in removing the prickles, in squeezing that fruit, he will extract all of its substance and will enjoy the best of that fruit. So the poor fruit is emptied of the good which it contained. Even more the prickles and the skin have been thrown away. The same for the soul. In coldness, in aridities, she casts natural satisfactions to the ground. She empties herself of herself and through constancy, she squeezes herself. So the soul remains with the pure fruit of good, and I enjoy the sweetness of it. Therefore, if you are constant, everything will serve you as good, and I will place my graces with confidence. September 18th, 1924, Volume 17 distance between living in the divine will and doing the will of God. I was thinking over what has been written on the living in the divine volition, and I prayed to Jesus that he would give me more light to be able to clarify more this blessed living in the divine will to those to whom I am obliged to do so. And my sweet Jesus told me, my daughter, unfortunately, they are slow in understanding it. To live in my will is to reign in it and with it, while to do my will is to be submitted to my orders. The first state is to possess. The second 
is to receive dispositions and execute commands. To live in my will is to make my will one's own, as one's own property, and to dispose of it. To do my will is to take it into account as will of God, not as one's own thing, nor can one dispose of it as he wants. To live in my will is to live with one single will, that of God, and since it is a will all holy, all pure, all peaceful, being one single will that reigns, there are no contrasts, everything is peace. Human passions tremble before this supreme will and would rather escape it, nor do they dare to even move or oppose it in seeing that heaven and earth tremble before this holy will. Therefore, the first step of living in the divine will, which allows a creature to receive the divine order, is in the depth of the soul, where grace moves her to empty herself of what is human, tendencies, passions, inclinations, and other things. On the other hand, to do my will is to live with two wills, in such a way that when I give orders to follow mine, the creatures feel the weight of their own will, which causes contrasts. And even though they follow the orders of my will with faithfulness, they feel the weight of their rebellious nature, of their passions and inclinations, how many saints, although they may have reached the highest perfection, feel their own will waging war against them, keeping them oppressed? And many are forced to cry out, Who will free me from this body of death? That is, from this will of mine that wants to give death to the good I want to do? To live in my will is to live as a son. To just do my will would be called, in comparison, living as a servant. In the first case, what belongs to the father belongs to the son, and then it is well known how servants are forced to make more sacrifices than sons do. They have to expose themselves to more tiring and more humble services, to cold, to heat, to traveling on foot and the like. In fact, how much did my saints not do, though most beloved friends of mine, in order to execute the orders of my will? Instead, a son remains with his father, takes care of him, cheers him up with his kisses and caresses. He gives orders to the servants as if his father were ordering them. And if he goes out, he doesn't walk, but travels in a coach. And while the son possesses all that belongs to his father, the servants are given only the recompense for their work they have done, remaining free to serve their master or not. And if they do not serve, they no longer have a right to receive any further compensation. On the other hand, Nobody can remove those intimate relations between father and son, by which the son possesses the goods of the father. And no law, either celestial or terrestrial, can cancel these rights, just as it cannot unbind sonship between father and son. My daughter, the living in my will, is the living that is closest to the blessed of heaven. It is so distant from one who is simply conformed to my will and does it, faithfully executing its orders, as much as heaven is distant from the earth, as much as the distance between a son and a servant, and between a king and a subject. Moreover, this is a gift which I want to give in these times, so sad, that they may not only do my will but possess it, Am I perhaps not free to give whatever I want, when I want, and to whom I want? Isn't a master free to say to his servant, Live in my house, eat, take, command as another myself? 
and so that nobody may prevent him from possessing his goods, he legitimizes this servant as his own son and gives him the right to possess. If a rich man can do so, much more can I do it. This living in my will is the greatest gift I want to give to the creatures. My goodness wants to show off more and more love toward creatures. And since I gave them everything, I want to give them the gift of my will, so that in possessing it, they may appreciate and love the great good they possess. And do not be surprised if you see that they do not understand. In order to understand, they would have to dispose themselves to the greatest of sacrifices, that of not giving life, even in holy things, to their own will. Then would they feel the possession of mine, and would touch with their own hands what it means to live in my will. You, however, be attentive, and do not be bothered by the difficulties they raise. Little by little I will make my way to make them understand the living in my will. September 18th, 1932, Volume 31 Page Written in the Divine Will Story of the Creature How God does not want us servants, but princes of his kingdom. Divine love in search of all creatures in order to love them. My abandonment in the divine volition continues. I feel hidden by its eternal waves, in which it hides everything. Nothing flees from its immensity, so that one who wants to find everything, embrace everything, listen to the story of each one, must enter into the sea of the supreme fiat. But while my mind was lost in it, my sweet Jesus visiting my little soul told me, Blessed daughter, my will encloses everything. Rather, for each creature it holds his written page of how his story should develop and form his life. And this page was written ab eterno. It was written in the light of our will, such that the life of each creature in time had its beginning, but in our supreme being it had no beginning. And he was loved by us with love without beginning and without end. Now the whole of creation did not yet exist, and we loved him, because he was already within us. We held the great birth of all creatures enclosed within the sanctuary of our divinity. In each one of them we looked at our little written page, his circumstances, his tiny little story, and according to this, what more or less was written, what must be fulfilled, and glorified our most holy will. So we loved him more intensely. You did not exist yet, but our will enclosed you, and loving you, we gave you the place, the rest, on our paternal knees. We gave you various lessons on our fiat, and oh, how much pleasure we took in seeing you listen and write in your soul as though copying what was written in our eternal page because you must know that what we want the creature to do in our will is first done by us, formed by us in our own volition, and then overflowing from us at once to do it and form it in the creature, making its field of divine action with him. So much is our love that we want nothing other than that she do what we have done, giving her the model of our act so that she can copy it. And how much help Assistance do we not give while she makes the copy, giving her our own will as her act, as prime material, so that the copy comes out according to our design. Now, every act of one who does his will does nothing other than ruin our design, forming some erasures on our written page. Every written word of ours contained a special and eternal love, it contained the development of his life according to our likeness, in which he would enclose his story of love 
and of fulfillment of his divine will toward his creator. The human volition does nothing other than counterfeit this page, throwing our likeness into confusion. And instead of forming the copy of our page, written with so much love for him, he has formed his page written with notes of sorrow, of confusion, and with a story so vile and base that the centuries won't make a memory of it, and the Eternal One will not find in him the echo of the story written on his page, in which his divine story must be praised by the creature. My daughter, there is a mistaken notion in the base world. They believe that the creature can live as though away from us. What mistake! What mistake! The whole of creation is nothing other than an inheritance come forth from us. Therefore it is ours. It belongs to us. So much so that although we have put it forth, still we brought it forth inseparable from us. And we want the honor, the glory of our inheritance, and that creatures are not our vile servants, but children, and as so many princes of our kingdom. And this princeship is given to them by the inseparability of our will, such that the creature can neither do without it, nor can he live nor separate himself, not even in hell itself. At the most some have it operating, and some have it conserving, of his being, without giving it the opportunity of letting it work good. To live without my will would be like the body living without the soul. That would be impossible. And one sees that when a member is cut off from the body, it has no motion. It loses heat and putrefies because it lacks the soul. It would be the same if he lacked my will. Everything would come to nothing. Now living in my will is exactly this. To feel flowing in all your being, in all your acts, the light, the divine strength, the life of my will, because where its operating life is not, that act remains without life, without heat, without strength, and divine light. It is as though dead to good, and when there is no good inside, evil forms, and he ends with putrefying. Oh, if the creature could see himself without the operating life of my volition, he would see himself so counterfeited that he would be horrified to look at himself. Therefore, let yourself always be overwhelmed by the eternal waves of my volition, in which you will find your written page, your story, woven with so much love over you, and so you will no longer be frightened by what we have disposed for you. You will find everything as things that belong to you, and that by absolute necessity must form your life, to fill your story and to satisfy our need of love, that ab eterno we wanted to make our will known. Be faithful, and do not hinder our love, and leave us free to develop our admirable designs formed over you. After this, I continued my abandonment in the divine fiat, and my sweet Jesus added, Good daughter, one who does and lives in my volition, rises into the unity of my will, and descends in it into all things, in order to give me her love in all things, in all creatures, and their acts. And I, my love, for as much as I do to love you in all creatures, and in all their acts, wanting to cover them all with my love, so that you, not receiving their love, might receive that love from everyone. Yet I see that not everyone loves you. This is a sorrow for me, because I think that my love has no vital strength, and therefore I do not know how to make you loved by everyone. And Jesus... My daughter, it is the strength of the unity of my volition that casts you over everyone and everything, in order to love in everything and give me the exchange of love of everyone. 
and if they do not love me, I cannot say that I do not receive yours. Rather, in your love, I hear the notes of the love that everyone should give me, and oh, how content I am by it. You must know that this is our divine office. From the height of our one and only act that we never interrupt, our light, love, power, and goodness descends and retraces all the acts, the heartbeats, the steps, the words, the thoughts, in order to mold them, invest them, and seal them with our love. We feel the irresistible need of love to go in search of everyone and everything, and we do not let anything escape us, not even a heartbeat, without giving it an I love you of ours. And they do not love us. On the contrary, there are some who flee from under the reign of our love. But in spite of all this, we continue. We do not stop because our divine nature is love and must love. And we feel the contentment, the happiness that our love gives us by loving her, that it has the virtue to love everyone, to extend itself to everyone and everywhere. Nor would happiness be full in us if our love could suffer from being unable to love everyone, nor would it stop if it does not see itself reciprocated. The same for you. Continue to love us for everyone, and to overwhelm everyone in our love. And even though all your intent is not obtained, you will hear the notes of our felicitating love, because you want to love us for everyone. September 18, 1938, Volume 36, How Jesus Feels His Sufferings Being Repeated in Ours, How He Never Moves in His Works and in His Love for Us, Example of the Flower for Those Who Do Not Live in Divine Will. I am in the sea of the divine volition, among immense bitternesses and the most humiliating humiliations, like a poor condemned. And if it weren't for Jesus, my support, strength, and help, I don't know how I could live. Then my sweet Jesus, sharing my pains, was suffering together with me, and in the ardor of his pains and love, told me, My dear daughter, if you knew how much I suffer, if I let you see it, you would die of pain. I am forced to hide everything, all the torment and the rawness of the pain I feel, not to distress you even more. Know that they didn't condemn you, but me together with you. I myself feel as though being condemned, since condemning good is condemning myself. You, however, unite in my will our condemnation to the one I received when I was crucified, and I will give you the merit of my condemnation and all the goods that it produces. It made me die. Then it called to life my resurrection, in which everyone was to find life and resurrection of all goods. With their sentence, they believe they can kill what I said on my divine will. But I will allow such chastisements and sad events that I will make my truths rise again more beautifully, more majestic, in the midst of the peoples. Therefore, from your side and mine, let us move nothing. Let us keep doing what we have done, even if everybody should be against us. This is my divine way, for all evil's creatures may do, I never move my works, I always preserve them with my creative power and virtue. For love of those who offend me, I always love them without ceasing. If we never move, our works are accomplished, remaining always beautiful, doing good to all. But if we move, all things would go into ruin and no good would be accomplished. Therefore in this too I want you with me, always still, 
never moving from inside my will and doing what you've done until now attentive to listen to me to be the narrator of my will my daughter what is not enjoyed today will be enjoyed tomorrow what now seems darkness because it finds blind minds will turn into sun tomorrow for those who have eyes how much good they will do so let's keep doing what we've done let us do what is needed from our side so that nothing may be missing of help light good and surprising truth to make my will known and to make it rain i will use every means of love grace and chastisement i will touch all sides of creatures in order to have my will reign when it will seem that the true good is about to die then it will rise again more beautiful and majestic but while he was saying this he showed me a sea of fire in which the whole world was about to be wrapped i was shaken and my adorable jesus pulling me toward himself told me my blessed daughter courage do not be afraid come into my divine will so that its light may remove from you the sad sight of what is happening in the world and as i talk to you about my will let us soothe the pains that unfortunately both of us are suffering see how beautiful it is to live in my will what i do the soul does as she hears my i love you she soon repeats to me i love you and i feeling loved transform her so much into myself that in one voice we say we love everyone we do good to all we give life to all if i bless we bless together we adore and glorify together we run together to help anyone and if they offend me we suffer together oh how happy i am in seeing that a creature never leaves me alone how beautiful is the company of one who wants what i want does what i do the union makes happiness arise heroism in doing good tolerance in bearing even more since she is a human creature belonging to the human family that does nothing other than send me nails thorns and pains not to sadden her i abstain from sending their deserved chastisement while finding in this creature my hiding place and my desired company i know that she would be sad if i punished them as they deserve therefore never leave me alone loneliness is one of the hardest and most intimate pains of my heart not having one to whom to say a word both in sufferings and joys makes me so delirious of pain and love that if you could experience it you would die of pure pain this is exactly not living in my will leaving me alone the human will takes the creature away from her creator and as she goes peace leaves while anxiety takes its place within her tormenting her lack of strength debilitates her beauty fades away good dies while evil arises passions keep her company poor creature without my will into what an abyss of miseries she throws herself it happens as to the flower that not being watered feels as if it's losing its life it becomes faded bends on its own stem and waits for death and if the sun enwraps it finding it with no water it burns it and dries it completely such is the soul without my will she is like a soul with no water my very truths 
which are brighter than the sun, not finding her watered by the life of my will, burn her even more, blinding her, so she is incapable of understanding them in order to receive the good and the life they possess. She even reaches the excess of making war on good and against my very truths that bring life to the creatures. And therefore I want you always in my will, so that neither of us suffer the hard pain of loneliness. End of September 18th Fiat